Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today at what may be one of our final vaccination press conferences. Um, pretty remarkable that we are here, uh, and it's not even June yet. I am thrilled to be here with our partners from Swedish and the city departments on what is probably has been the most beautiful mm -hmm. testing site in the nation, but more importantly, one of the most effective testing sites for community. Um, through, you will see from the data and statistics that this really served as a hub for people from the community um, and was one of our key successes in making sure that we had equitable vaccine distribution. Um, almost three months ago, we came together here at Rainier Beach to announce that our vaccination effort would set up a number of fixed sites. We were launching sites at Lumen Field, Rainier Beach, West Seattle, that later followed at North College. And at, we were still at that time in the middle of a surge in our pandemic. The amount of virus was increasing in our community. And we said at the time it was a race between the virus and the vaccination. I don't think any of us thought at that moment we'd be able to come together this soon to be able to announce the next phase for our city. Um, we are just a few weeks from opening safely and meaningfully for our city. Seattle has had an enormous success in vaccinating our residents and workers. We've been working on vaccination since December. Uh, I know many of you are tired of hearing from me because we have every step of the way tried to enforce how important it was for our community to get vaccinated. And that that really was the road to us reopening safely and be able to come together again as a community. And we are so close. The Seattle Fire Department became the first EMS agency in the entire state to administer vaccines, building on their great success on testing. FAS, um, who you'll be hearing from, and Swedish launched the largest civilian run vaccination location in the country, because what we do in Seattle is audacious. And we delivered vaccine more equitably than many other places across the country. We saw early on in this pandemic that our communities of color were hit disproportionately by this disease, both by the health impacts and the economic impacts. We saw the early vaccination numbers showing that again, it was our communities of color that were lagging behind. And so we doubled down as a city to make sure that we centered people in equity. We successfully advocated to the Biden administration for additional resources for our community health clinics, for our mobile teams, for community hubs, and for Lumen. I had hoped that we would see the pendulum swing about June, optimistically, where we would have more vaccine than people who wanted it. And we were able to beat that by weeks because we accelerated and had such great partnerships, but mostly because of people in this city. Community organizations stepped up to make sure that they could be trusted partners to help community get vaccinated. And the people of Seattle, every time we've asked them to do something hard through this pandemic, they have done it. And we have seen the results. The city of Seattle has the lowest incidence of disease and hospitalization and deaths of any major city in America. And all of us should be proud of that, but we should never lose sight of this huge amount of suffering that's also occurred this year. I'm very pleased that out of the 230,000 vaccinations uh, that we have done in the city, 48% of those vaccinated by the city identified as being from the BIPOC community, which is about 15% higher than the population uh, reflected. Right here at Rainier Beach, 57%. 57% of those vaccinated by Seattle Fire identified as being people of color. And this is truly a community resource. It became a walk-up hub first and it was used. And we've seen from the data that it really did serve the people of Rainier Beach, Rainier Valley, and Beacon Hill. This hub was used and we are so thankful for the partnership with Swedish, the work by fire, and with the community-based organizations who just kept getting people to be vaccinated. Um, because of this efforts, because of all these combined efforts, Seattle is neck and neck with San Francisco as the most vaccinated city in America. Right now, over 76% of eligible Seattle residents have begun the vaccination process. Over 76%. And more than 60% are fully vaccinated. 
So we expect to surpass the 70% mark in early June. And depending on what those doses were, within two to three weeks from now, we will be at record numbers. Um, if you know someone who is not yet vaccinated or who is wavering, please get them vaccinated. We will still make it easy. Um, we are announcing today, though, that we're going to be closing down our fixed sites. Now that the vast majority of Seattleites have begun the vaccination process, we're able to safely reopen as a city and recover. And we don't need the fixed sites in the same way. Um, all of those people who've been working so hard on the sites, um, you know, Lewin, for example, staffed by hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteers, Swedish Hospital, FAS, Seattle IT. Um, all of these people were also doing their day jobs. And as we reopen, we know our city needs to recommit itself to all the things we need to do to open the doors. Seattle Fire Mobile Teams will continue to bring pop-up clinics to where people are, whether that's in parks, schools, ball games, neighborhoods. We will be innovative and we will work with community-based organizations to make sure that we continue our equity focus. At the Seattle Fire Department's SOTO testing site, they'll now also be administering vaccines. So people who receive their first dose, if they're wondering where to go, that is a place they can go. You know, none of this incredible success would be possible if the people and residents of Seattle had not stepped up every time through the toughest time our city has ever faced. And it wouldn't have been possible without the hard work of our city employees and our partners at Swedish. This was built from the ground up with dedicated public servants, whether it was Seattle IT developing the back end so that all the computer stuff worked flawlessly, or FAS standing up the largest civilian site and additional sites and the testing sites. Um, our, our Office of Immigrant and Affairs, OIRA, it had been continuing since the beginning of the pandemic to be such a critical resource because we saw our communities of color, particularly our immigrant and refugees, devastated by the pandemic and having to turn our city resources around to serve those communities, that work didn't stop. They kept doing that and the work behind this. So I'm really proud of what the city's been able to do because they, they never, no city worker ever said no. They never said why. They just said how and how do we help. Seattle's vaccination efforts, I really believe, show government at its best. It shows when we are in the midst of a crisis, when it matters the most, we're able to come together and serve our businesses and residents and do it in a way that really protects community health and advances equity. I'm really humbled to be part of this team, to be standing here with these folks and with the hundreds and hundreds of those behind them who made sure this was possible. I again want to thank our partners at Swedish um, and recognize all the city departments who've helped. You'll be hearing some of them. I said it earlier this week that for the first time since I got that call in February um, uh, 28th, I believe there's a light at the end of the tunnel and this time it's not a train. We are really at that moment of hope where we know we can start to reopen. We can restore the health of our, of our city. We can reopen our businesses. We can come together again. And because of the lessons we have learned again over the last year, we know we must center it on equity. And we must make sure that when we build back, we build back better and stronger and more justly. And so with that, I want to turn it over to a person who has been such a fundamental, pivotal person throughout this process, uh, Renee Rousey or Bomers of Swedish Hospital. Many of you have met her at Lumens. Before that, they did the clinic at Seattle University. She has been just a pivotal force, and we would not have been able to do this without her and without the partnership of Swedish. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Where'd Renee go? There she is. Thank you so much, Mayor Durkin. I am so honored and relieved to be here to celebrate the work that we've done together for the community vaccination site at Lumen Field. Our Swedish care teams and other healthcare systems in the area, and it truly was a compilation of several entities in our organization, have been on the front lines throughout this pandemic, and we're proud to be a part of this historic event. Between vaccinating our caregivers, our community vaccination sites, our Seattle U Clinic, and the mobile clinics, in addition to Lumen, we have administered 201,285 vaccinations. Wow. It's, 
and nearly 100,000 of that was at Lumen. Our mission to prove the health and well-being of each person that we serve does not confine Swedish to the four walls of our hospital and clinics. I'm grateful, so grateful to all our community partners, including Seattle University, Cellnetics, T-Mobile, Denali, and our union partners, SCIU, with the work we did on the mobile clinics, and of course, Mayor and the city, FAS, and Lumen, and our partnership down at Lumen Field. Truly, these partnerships have saved lives. And most importantly, we've supported our communities, hit as hard as by COVID-19. We've approached this work with an equitable lens, which is reflected in the data that was just shared by Mayor Durkin. I always wanna take a moment to thank our volunteers. The stories that we've experienced from volunteers, nurses at the front lines, physicians exhausted, has been critical to their healing and success. This has been a meaningful way to be able to achieve the light at the end of the tunnel for many of them. Hundreds of volunteers, clinical and non-clinical, contributed not only their time, but energy in the support. And we're excited to be able to celebrate with the city in reopening. I wanna thank everyone for all that they have done to help roll out vaccine distribution safely and quickly as possible. Now I would like to introduce a partner in crime, <laughs> Calvin Goings from FAS. Thank you. I'm Calvin Goings, Director of the City's Department of Finance and Administrative Services, or FAS, and the Chief Executive Officer of the Community Vaccination Site at Lumen Field. You know, the day we opened Lumen Field, when many of you were there, I said, the road to recovery runs right through Lumen Field. And that's evident by the fact that of the more than 230,000 doses that have been given by the City of Seattle, nearly half, nearly half of those have been done at Lumen alone. And just recently, we broke the record at Lumen for the largest number of doses given on a single day anywhere, anywhere in the United States of America with over 8,500 doses provided. But the numbers we care most about are these. Seattle is now near the top of cities in the nation with the highest vaccination rate and more than 75%, as you heard of the mayor say, of city residents have now received their first dose. Simply put, Seattle showed up. Our residents recognized the urgent moment that we were in, and they've done their part to protect themselves, each other, and help our city recover. We're at this point today, thanks to our residents. So thank you, Seattle. I also want to thank the incredible partners at Swedish and First and Goal and the wonderful community of volunteers that made this possible. Thanks to our colleagues across the city, starting with our friends at OIRA and the Seattle Fire Department who led the way, and of course the mayor herself for supporting this work at every single turn and insisting that we embed, embed equity and inclusion in our work. I also want to thank our community partners who worked collaboratively with us to expand access and equity at the site. You know, not only was Lumen the largest civilian-led site in the entire country, I'd wager it was the most equitable and grounded in accessibility at every turn. And the numbers that we are the most proud of is that over 40% of those vaccinated at Lumen identified as BIPOC. And finally, I wanna thank the employees of FAS. None of this would have been possible without them. You know, FAS has often been called the city's junk drawer, or I would prefer a utility drawer. And I'd also say the most organized utility drawer. It's because we truly have the most diverse portfolio of any city department, from the animal shelter, to the customer service bureau, to licensing and tax administration, fleets, facilities, insurance, real estate, the list goes on. And that's why I'm so proud of the team at FAS. They're not experts in mass vaccinations. Heck, none of us were before this started. They redeployed from their existing day jobs as warehousers, taxi inspectors, fleet mechanics, and accountants. When the city needed them most, they came together, applied their skills, learned new ones, and got the job done. They have been on the front lines of this pandemic in our city's response from day one, whether it was purchasing and equipping our city staff with PPE, creating safety protocols for all of our city facilities, helping our friends at Seattle Fire stand up the test sites, and of course, opening Lumen Field. Their work, our work is 
represents the largest mobilization of city resources in a lifetime. And when they look back on this time, they can be confident that they made a real and life-saving difference. Just like on that first day that I said the road to recovery runs through Lumen Field, it runs through all of our community sites as well. And it's a road that has been built by the dedicated employees of FAS, Seattle Fire, OIRA, and the departments behind us, and all of our partners, colleagues, and volunteers. And thanks to them and their hard work, the road ahead is bright. I'd now like to invite a good friend and an amazing partner, Chief Scoggins. Chief. Calvin, we refer to it as a toolbox. Toolbox. Right. Or the soft drawer. Yeah. <laughs> hey, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Harold Scoggins, Fire Chief of the Seattle Fire Department. And this is one of those really, really proud moments that we've gotten to this point. But I don't think we would be here without our leadership of our mayor. And Mayor, I want to thank you for all of your leadership over the past 16 months. It feels like 16 years <laughs> in, in getting us to this point. Uh, the mayor provided consistent leadership and guidance and direction to all of the city family teams that have been working towards this goal. And there's so many um, to thank along the way. Our medical director, uh, Dr. Michael Sayer is here. And Dr. Michael Sayer and Dr. Tom Ray provided guidance to the county fire and EMS departments so we can actually get through the last 16 months safely and still respond out each and every day to those 911 calls that the communities depend on. And then the people who are really the architects of our team and putting these sites together is Acting Captain Brian Wallace and Sarah Smith and Julie Klein over here. Julie doesn't show up much, but she's here today. But, but Julie, is, Julie makes sure we get it done. And Julie is the mayor's public safety advisor. And so that team, along with our city family, has really been working hard over the last 15 months. So let me tell you what we've been doing. So over the last 15 months, we've tested over 758,000 people. Uh, for COVID-19 at our four sites. Since we started doing vaccinations on January 14th in the Seattle Fire Department, we've now vaccinated over 133,000 people. Now, right here at Rainier Beach in our West Seattle sites, over 50,000 people have been vaccinated at each one of those sites. And our mobile vaccination teams have vaccinated over 26,000 people. And our mobile vaccination team really does the heavy lifting. They've been to over 300 locations around the city, meeting people where they are. Permanent supportive housing, adult family homes. You may have seen them at Dick's Drive-In or QFC or the Sounders game. Um, you pick a location, we have probably been there, over 300 locations. 59% of that 26,000 is from the BIPOC community. That's really working hard to meet people where they are. You know, we couldn't have done this without our partnership with FAS. I remember it was just over a year ago, we all showed up at the Aurora location. And I guess I had shorts and flip flops on that day to look at that emission site to see, hey, could we turn this into a testing site? And boy, did we ever turn it into a testing site. But change is ahead of us now, and we're excited about the change. On June 9th, our West Seattle site will be winding down on June the 9th, and that, that's a proud day. And remember, we started all this June 5th, 2020, so just a little bit over a year. On June 23rd, right here at Rainier Beach, um, this Rainier Beach site will be shutting down on June 23rd. Our Soto site, as the mayor mentioned, it will continue to stay open for testing and vaccinations. As a matter of fact, we started doing vaccinations there yesterday. And our mobile teams will continue to work and serve the community. I think today we got four teams out there at four different locations serving the community. So it's a real proud day, but I wanna close with some thank you inside the department to our boots on the ground firefighters. They have been working so hard because just because they've been working here at our testing and vaccination sites, they're the same people showing up at the fire stations, running those emergencies. And we had a few big deals happen over the last year from second alarm structure fires, from a piece of the pier falling into the water, water rescues, and all the different emergencies that we responded to in 2020, over 80,000 times we went out the door to continue to serve community. So I wanna thank our partnerships with Local 27, led by President Kenny Stewart and Local 2898, led by President Tom Walsh, our labor partners really is what makes a difference in the Seattle Fire Department. And close with saying thank you to the community. It's really important that you showed up. We're gonna ask you to keep showing up. 
We hope something happens. Now that we announced the closure on June 9th of West Seattle and June 23rd of Rainier Beach, we hope there's a rush to get, come and get those vaccinations. So we're gonna encourage you to do that. One of our city partners, I'm gonna introduce Director Kuvu to speak next, the Director of Immigrant and Refugee, uh, Refugee Affairs. So Ku, the podium is yours. Wow, uh, so great to join you, um, particularly here, because this is where I was vaccinated. This is my neighborhood. Um, so it's been over a year since I've had the privilege of standing with the mayor and my esteemed colleagues and um, at an in-person event like this. And it's been so long that I actually had to find something other than jogger pants to wear today. <laughs> um, and then I had to dust off all those clothes. Um, but not only is it an honor to be with you today, it's an honor for my team. Um, we're so small that we call ourselves the mighty uh, Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, or as we like to say, OIRA. Um, when the mayor gave us the uncomfortable, ex uncomfortably exciting challenge of um, achieving 70% vaccination rate, um, we were one of the first departments that uh, were called upon by the mayor's office to ensure that our vulnerable immigrant and refugee communities could easily and quickly access available vaccines. And so we were proud to partner with all of our colleagues and departments here. It was truly a one Seattle effort. Um, and together we ensured that equity, cultural competency and language accessibility were all integrated throughout Seattle's evolving vaccine campaign. Um, and as was mentioned before, and I'm proud to say it again, that that work spoke for itself. 48% of those vaccinated by the city identified as BIPOC. Um, and to quote my favorite musical, truly immigrants, we get the job done. <laughs> and to this point, um, I would like to take a moment to read to you an excerpt from a community member, herself an immigrant, um, who throughout the past months has been steadfast in her advocacy, along with a collective that she built with over 100 individuals, um, not tied to any organizations, but they themselves individually contributing their time after work hours and on weekends to ensure vaccine equity and partnering with the city to share their um, ideas for how we can improve our services. And in her email to the mayor, she wrote, I am following up to thank you for your leadership and the city of Seattle's responsiveness to concerns raised about equitable access to vaccines at Lumenfield, especially for elders, BIPOC communities, refugee and immigrant families, and others who have been both disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and who have faced systemic inequities in COVID response, resources and assistance. Staff from your office, the Finance Administrative uh, Services Department, the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs responded immediately meeting with members of our Vaccine Equity Community Collective to hear concerns and then working quickly to put improvements in place. We would like to recognize their commitment to centering the community needs, respect for community voice and knowledge and, and unwavering focus on improving looming field operations to serve people with the greatest barriers to access. It's emails like this, comments from community members who are, we're committed to serving and by we, I mean all of us, thoughtful posts on social media, those are what we live for, that's what we strive for, and those are the highest and most significant forms of recognition. So um, I would also like to take a moment to personally acknowledge the OER team members. We're so small that there's no fear of missing somebody. Um, so, and they worked tirelessly on vaccine distribution, often long into the night and on weekends, um, shout out to Oksana, Peggy, Lynn, Jose, Joaquin, Jessica, Catherine, your hard work and ongoing commitment to equity and access for immigrants and refugees is to be lauded. And while today marks a major milestone, we know that the work is far from finished, especially when it comes to COVID-19 recovery and vaccinating the rest of the 24% of Seattle residents who have yet to receive their first shots. So, um, I'm making mental note to myself that our next goal is beat San Francisco. So thank you, people of Seattle. Thank you for showing the, um, how great we are and showing the rest of the country how this can be done. We look forward to continuing to serve you. Back to you, Mayor. Ku, thank you for that. And uh, it would not be a press conference these days if I didn't remind people 
We are in so much better place, but we're not done. We are not out of the woods in a lot of regards. Number one, we have seen a rise of the variants in this area. Um, and some of those variants are much more communicable and lead to worse disease. The virus preys on the vulnerable. In the early days we saw that was our seniors, people with health conditions, and our essential workers who had no choice but to be out. The most vulnerable people today are going to be those people not vaccinated because we have done a great job in getting vaccinations for our seniors, for our essential workers, and for others. We still have work to do in equity because we still see communities of color. There's a gap there and we're gonna to continue to work with those trusted partners to do that. I also want to remind people, if you go into a public place in Seattle, Dr. Duchin has made clear in King County in Seattle, please still wear a mask when you're inside because we do know that there's a rise in those variants and we want to keep people safe. I just have to close, though, by saying thank you again to all the people behind me. When the pandemic hit, we, uh, we started the, uh, activated the Emergency Operations Center. Um, and we would have a morning, sometimes twice a day, sometimes three times a day meeting to see where we were. And all of us watched in horror as we saw our senior centers starting to be devastated by this disease and more and more elders and, and people couldn't visit their parents or their grandparents. Um, and Chief Scoggins in one of the meetings, I said, Chief, you've got EMTs, can't you test? Um, and he said, well, we could. I said, bring me back a program. And many people would say it's not possible or we don't have access to testing equipment or we have to get a special certification. He brought back, he consulted with Dr. Sayre, he worked for the University of Washington and brought back a plan to get it done. And those early days where we went into some of the senior centers to test everyone, not just those who were showing the disease, really set the stage for our ability to know what we needed to do to scale it. And every step of the way, every single person behind me and the teams behind them were innovative. And they were all going through the same thing every one of us was during the pandemic. Fear, fear of losing a family member, of getting sick yourself, dealing with your kids at home. Um, but time after time, they stepped up and the people of Seattle stepped up. And for that, I will always be enormously thankful. With that, any questions? Quick question. One is, is there a chance that these fixed sites could come back when the boosters, when they need up this, this surge of people needing that potential booster shot? And then the second question is, so great questions the two questions were one is there a chance to fix vaccination sites will come back as as the disease progresses and the second is now that we can reopen what are our first steps so um, we are, unfortunately with this pandemic, we have always had to look at the next two or three steps down the road. And I've had the very good fortune of being advised by some of the best public health experts in the country and nationally and internationally. And to have a strong, strong Department of Health at the state and, and Patty Hayes and Jeff Duchin at the county. We know that this fall could be a really bad season because we expect the flu to come back. We had almost no incident of the flu last year because of the precautions people taking. We could have a huge resurgence of the flu at the same time COVID comes back, people will be concerned. Do I have the flu? Do we have COVID? So we're already looking at what do we need to be had prepared for if we need to increase our amount of testing, for example. We're working with the University of Washington who's going to take over a number of the testing facilities. That information will be public. But we're always looking to the next iteration because as determined as we are, we have seen this virus is just as determined and we have to be taking the next steps. Um, on reopening, uh, the first thing we're doing is to make sure that we can serve the, the people, residents, and business of Seattle. The whole city family has been working on how do we start amping up our work and making sure that we're there as a, to serve the people and businesses of Seattle as the city government to support people. So we've been working really hard to bring our own people to work. I've been meeting with the downtown business associations, the various commercial, I've been doing walking tours of Ballard and Columbia City and uh, places throughout the city to say, how do we open up as a city everywhere and what kind of celebrations can we have? Um, we've gotten some great ideas from folks Soon we'll be uh, rolling out with the city council what we think we will be doing with the rescue plan dollars and embedded in that is a whole range of things to reopen our city um, uh, culturally, our arts organizations, our neighborhoods.
but also to support the people that still need the support, that direct support for people who still need housing assistance, rental assistance, groceries, because um, we're not out of the woods and, and a lot of people are still living on the margins. How do you uh, define success? In other words, fully vaccinated, what does that mean and, and who's monitoring this friendly competition with other cities? Um, so I think success will be measured a period of years from now and it will be reflection on how did we not just get through the pandemic but what lessons did we learn about community health and equity because true community health doesn't come just from vaccines or from from healthcare itself it means we are making the necessary investments in uh, access to affordable housing health care education all those things that make a community strong and resilient and we saw in such stark contrast through the pandemic how much inequity there was in our system was laid bare um, and it was our community of colors the people living at the margins who had the greatest impacts both health wise and economically so success to me means do we learn those lessons and do we create a more just and resilient society fully vaccinated does that mean what exactly fully vaccinated means you are two weeks past your last dose so if you're Johnson & Johnson, you're one and done. If you are uh, get either Pfizer or Moderna, it's two weeks past and you're fully vaccinated. That's when the science and data shows that the, the vaccines are most effective. How does a city become fully vaccinated? Is that a certain percentage? Or certain percentage. So right now, everyone that is 12 and older is eligible to be vaccinated. And we have, with a great partnership with Seattle Public Schools, have gone into every high school and middle school to be able to vaccinate both the staff and the students because that was a critical late gap that we had. And we've had great success on that, that age range. So we are measuring from 12 to our oldest person alive. What percent, when, are you, when do you feel the city is fully? 100%. Percent. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ambitious. You know, I, look, we are, we've got to, we also know we're going to start needing boosters, right? As someone has raised, is because the because the variants are there. You already see Pfizer and Moderna working on the next booster, and I think most of us have to expect, just like you get mo many people get flu shots every year, we'll be getting a COVID booster, um, because we have seen that, like for example, in the King County area, um, one of the variants that came from Britain is the dominant strain now. But we also see that there's variants coming from India and Brazil that seem to be much more pernicious. Um, and so that's one reason why we really want to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Chris. What will the decision making be like in June to have a pop-up clinic? I mean, will people be able to call up and say, hey, come over to my apartment complex, housing development, because they can't go to a mass vaccination site? You know, we look at a range of those things. A really good question is how do we decide when to have the pop-ups in the future? Obviously, we want to get as many people as possible, but we also want to serve those people who won't have otherwise have access like we have before. So we will continue to work with community-based organizations, with schools, with the universities, with community groups, and anywhere we think that we can go where there will be people coming or people already present, we're going to find a way to get there. Uh, last summer, when the pandemic was at its height, a lot of public spaces were closed, such as uh, parts of Lake Washington Boulevard and other parks. This, with the sites going away, the vaccination sites going away, that's kind of a signal that we're coming out of that. Is there, will there be any moves such as shutting down public spaces or op opening them back up in certain different ways from before that we can see any moves like that? Yeah, I think we're right now, the Seattle Department of Transportation um, and some of our other departments are evaluating our closed streets, for example. We found in some of our neighborhood commercial districts in particular, that people really like having that outdoor space and having the streets converted to a place they can have, you know, dining and gathering. We're looking to keep as many of those open as possible. Um, we're also looking for those streets that we close so people would have a place to spread out and walk. We want to keep as much of that. So we're evaluating street by street and my direction to SDOT has been presume we keep them closed unless there's countervailing reasons we need to do it. Um, you'll see here really um, right before uh, we opened up this site, we also were able to do some funding for the redevelopment of this park, refurbishment of this park. So I think you'll see that work um, start up and, and be more robust. And so I think, you know, look, our public spaces are such a part of who we are in Seattle. And I think we're fortunate that we're moving into 
summer um, and that people will be outside again and we want to make those spaces as, as welcoming for people as possible. All right, thank you everybody and thanks to these people. One person who's kind of tried to stay a little quiet was Dwayne. <laughs> but what he's done for schools, any parent who has their kids working from home um, or had students they didn't know what they could do with because there was no study place for them to study online, he has been working to make sure digital equity and setting up with parks, study places for our students. So Dwayne, my hat's off to you too.